this conference to... will now be recorded. Oh, that, and that will bring us into Peerless. Uh, so this is a relaunch, a rebrand of Peerless. Now this isn't the same Peerless that was launched back in retail 25 years ago. You know, so a little history on Peerless. Delta was actually the very last manufacturer to allow retail to sell their brand. You know, we're the holdout. We're 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 protecting the plumber for years and years and years. And that's why Peerless was launched, is so we could we could launch a brand in retail, and and still keep Delta as the the trade brand. Um, obviously, over the years, you know. That's changed since then, uh, but Peerless has come back over into the trade as well. So, so you get the, both, the best of both worlds. We still have trade SKUs and retail SKUs on the Delta side. We really try to keep that separate so we have trade SKUs. They are different. Um, some of the wholesale SKUs are available on the trade side or on the retail side, but we can get all of the retail SKUs um, from the big box store. So if you've got a customer that is insistent upon a certain style within the big box, um, we can get access to that. Uh, they are limited SKUs. Typically you've got a four inch center and a widespread and a shower, that's it. So they are very limited on their SKU count. You don't get the accessories, you don't get the Roma tubs, you don't get the thermostatic showers you know, on, on that retail side. So there, we still really cater towards the plumber and really want to give you guys an advantage when you're selling to your homeowners and to your builders. Um, but that brings me back to Peerless. So they have rebranded Peerless um, for the trade. You know, this is, it, like I said, it's not your, your Peerless of 25 years ago. You know, this is good quality product. Um, you're getting ceramic valving in it and it looks really good you know it's almost it's almost kind of scary how good it looks you know because you've got some some spring faucets in here you know if you go into uh onto page 13 this is the westchester it just opened for order and it's going to be shipping in about three weeks and you notice you've got a spring faucet you've got a bridge faucet you've got bar faucets you know this has never been seen in peerless before you know, it, uh, it carries a lifetime warranty, and it has a 10-year warranty on your multifamily and commercial projects. Typically, in this price point range, you're not seeing those types of warranties. You know, a lot of times you're seeing a one-year and a 10-year on residential. Um, so it is a unique uh, characteristic of Peerless and shows how much Delta actually believes in the quality that they're producing with Peerless. Um, the way, it, and you might ask the question, well, why would I why would I go Delta and not just go Peerless then? Because they are looking so good. Um, you know, they, they do, they are a little bit smaller um, and they are imported product. You know, so kind of keep that in mind um, when you are specifying Peerless. It's great product, but it does fit that niche of multifamily, uh, very inexpensive townhomes. It's not meant to go into those custom homes and even semi-custom homes. Um, I know it sounds funny to, to kind of sell against ourselves a little bit, but it is great product um, So for that right application. And the other one that just launched is the Xander series, and you can kind of see this. This is a, a great little Xander product, you know, very contemporary in design, and price point-wise in the single handle, you're coming in at $159 list price, so very competitively priced. Uh, pull out, very contemporary design, very good look to it, swivel spout to it, nice little docking pull out, you can feel it kind of snap into place, um, and it, uh, list price on this is coming in at $191, you know, so it is a very competitively priced, the pull down is actually almost the exact same price point, so you can get a, a pull down list price, remember, list price, you're going to be paying substantially less than that. Um, if you do want pricing, get in touch with us. We'll get you in, in touch with the, the correct people um, that are stocking the product and can get you the pricing that you need and they can get you the best price in the marketplace. If you've got projects, we, we can quote this down pretty heavily as well. Um, so Peerless is aggressive. They want that multifamily business. And 
where you're pairing it with the Delta multiply choice Ruffin valve, you've got something that is going to be trusted. You know this valve is going to be solid. You don't have to, to worry about having something put into the wall and then being locked into that very limited skew range. You know, you put this in the wall and say they, they find some additional funds and they want to increase that value. You can go all the way up to Brizo if you want. And vice versa, you know, more and more we're seeing value engineering. You can rough this into the wall. They might have a Brizo spec and then they need to go down to Delta or it's a Delta spec and you need to go down to Peerless. You know, that's what we're actually seeing a little bit more, unfortunately, but, you know, it is there for you and you're not locked into where you were in the past with, you know, just a very limited skew on some of the imported values. I, I don't know how many projects we're tracking that are in trouble as far as the budget is concerned. They're totally over budget. So with this, with this type of a concept, it gives you the ability to go back into your developer Say, hey, we've got an option here that I think we can be this job and save you some money on uh, if you need to. And that's kind of the whole concept is, is being able to hit those price points that uh, the developer's looking for. Any questions? I think we're, uh, we're at about 14 minutes. So any questions that uh, we can answer for you? Or... Thank you. Is everybody familiar with the, the diamond valve or, or diamond uh, PST valve, the ceramic, yes. So every every single handle faucet now that Delta has in the Delta and Brizo line has this, we call it diamond cell technology, where we then actually put diamond particles onto a ceramic disc, and there's, there's no lubrication that uh, is required. So every other ceramic disc that's out there has to have lubrication in it or it's gonna seize up. With this new technology that Delta has uh, developed, uh, there's there's no grease inside the cartridge. Um, it just is a very slick, slick surface that'll keep working. They tested this out to uh, five million cycles, which is about a hundred years worth of simulated service. At the end of that, it didn't seize. There wasn't any deterioration of the cartridge. Uh, they just said, "We're happy." Shut off the machine. Uh, extremely dependable. No leaks. Um, ceramic. Cartridge. What about um, the old crap that's in the galvanized lines and stuff? And water. So th this is a, it's using diamonds, so it's the hardest substance known to man, plus it's a shearing action. So if you look at that, those discs yes. that I just passed around, you're actually shearing that around and cleaning that. as you're, Every single time you turn it on, you're actually polishing the surface. So instead of a up and down closing, where a lot of times debris will get stuck in between those, um, you do get that shearing and cleaning plus because you're going to be shearing that yeah, particle what are, Whatever's in there. It's just it's just polarizing and yeah. sending it yeah. out into the water stream You know the worst case scenario would be you may have a clogged uh, aerator, you know where it comes through unlike a, uh, a Rubberized type material where those particles get embedded into into those seats. You've seen that oh, yeah. and you know eventually they just fail and then you've got a silicone gasket instead of a rubber o-ring so that's not going to break down like normal traditional so the only connection point the only seal you have is right there coming on to what we call the hockey puck um, with that anaflex waterway it eliminated 70 percent of your potential leak points because before they cross link this and, and make it pex they put it all together so this actually is one piece of pex even though it looks like it's multiples and then with this connection as long as you leave this on, connect this in. This is a warranty for life connection. You know, and you can just loop it, stab it right into your stop. You've got your nut on there already. Once again, labor savings and two potential leak points that you're cutting out. Still Instead, you've got a warranty. Longer. Do what? They still need to make them longer. Yes. You're well, running into short. 32 inches. Ours are 30. They're 32. Two. Yeah, 32 inches below the deck. Yep. Yeah, I know there's a lot of them out there that are short. They put on little, little braided supplies or, you know, so, You're yeah, 32 up. inches below the deck. This is not, this is a sample. Right. Yeah, this is not <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> sorry, the, the, new, the actual one is a big 32-inch loop. So. 
kitchen welcome. Yep. Supplies. Yeah, anything that says DST at the back of it is going to come with your supplies. And the DST is going to have this cartridge. Yeah. Yep. But all, all of our single handle faucets have it now. Single yeah, handle and two handle. And two handle as well. Any other questions? Before we wrap up, appreciate the time. Thank you. Um, let me give you my cell phone number again for those that aren't here. 801-510-0629. Uh, Happy to help out with uh, with any of your needs, specs, problems, whatever. He you know, loves, here for he loves calls at like 9 p.m. And yeah, those are my favorite. Two, two, eight. <laughs> yeah. One more time on the phone number. 801-510-0629. And to be honest with you, if you call me at 9 o'clock, if I can answer, I will answer because I know those are the important calls. Because if you're willing to bug me at that time of hour, then I know you need something. So I will answer if, if at all possible. Leave me a voicemail, shoot me a text, we'll take care of you. Um, yeah, we're, we're lifers with Delta. Been here for 20 years and we'll be here for another 20. So happy to be here. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Very much. Sorry we didn't Thanks have for pizza, pizza for the other guys on the other end. <laughs> that's their problem. That's, 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 their, that's their problem. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Jason. You ready for me to take over? You are. Go for it. Okay, I just sent you a request to go ahead and take, activate that, see if my screen comes up for you. Okay, send me another thing. I can't get through fast time. Isn't it over there? Share my screen. That's something. Anybody need more price books for a shop or anything? It's online, isn't it? Yeah. That's what most of the guys are doing now. Yep. Might not even touch me anymore. So I guess it's amazing are, though how many times we hear you say, "Oh well," because we have a couple manufacturers that aren't printing books anymore. Yeah. And then, man, you think the world's collapsing. Oh, okay, <laughs> you know, but then. then most of them are for you. Need a book, and you're going. Yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> you're set. There we go. Okay. Hello, everyone. How you doing tonight? Good. Oh, just uh, I've got a, uh, I guess, a request to do some instruction on codes that are outside of the IPC. And so, for some of you that are also in the uh, HVAC industry. This would apply to you as well because in both the uh, plumbing code and the mechanical code, we have references that uh, basically in your general provision sections that you cannot, uh, I guess, destroy the integrity of the structure and it refers you to the IBC and IRC for those provisions. So tonight I've kind of put uh, something together that uh, shows some of the challenges you're going to be running into out on the job sites that will address these. So please. Uh, if you have questions, don't hesitate to interrupt or ask those, and I'll give you some references, and maybe I can send a, these papers over to Dave so he can have available to you as a membership as well that uh, shows you the different dimensions you're allowed to do in different types of structural members. So just by way of introduction, I'm Jason Van Osdahl. Some of you have been in my classes before uh, through the Utah Plumbing and Heating Contractors Association and your CE classes. Um, uh, the senior member of Van Osdahl Productions, LLC. So with that, I uh, just kind of like to get to know who you guys are. I know some of you are board members there for the Plumbing and Heating Contractors Association. It sounds like we have some people from St. George. Is that correct? We have them from all over the place. From all over the place. Awesome. So any HVAC contractors, as well yeah we do great so uh, Dave I guess in that regard I will be covering the structural aspects and there will be a lot of photographs and stuff dealing with the structural aspects too for HVAC so I don't know what you can do there to help them out with the CE credits for their 
uh, you, trade specific. But you get credit for that as well if they have an HVAC license. Great, great. Okay, so in dealing with structural, uh, this picture just kind of shows some uh, foundation straps is what you're looking at as the primary focus, but you can see just in the background there, we've got some plumbing that comes in and we've got uh, some protection on some drain waste piping with our uh, foam that goes around that. So we're, we're protecting the structural integrity of our plumbing as well. And that's something that's, that's overlooked with, when we see structure, we talk about the notching and boring and cutting of structural members and everything else. But in fact, we've also got to protect our system. And this is why, you know, you have this requirement where you're, you've got your concrete slab that comes up and you've basically got to protect that piping as it comes through. So we're, we're protecting the structural integrity of that drainway system. Uh, oftentimes, as you exercise a plumbing facility or, or fixture for that matter, you're going to have some movement on that pipe. You're going to have movement on that pipe as you have different uh, temperature conditions. So we end up with an abrasive uh, action that happens around that pipe and end up wearing those things out. So uh, in this uh, slide, we've got some obvious structural integrity issues going on, but not necessarily the notching and boring aspect, but the footing and foundation support. And I know this isn't done by most of you as the plumbers, but by the excavator, but right where you connect onto that uh, Y going under a foundation, for example, is something you are responsible for. And so in this case, we're undermining the footing and foundation, and we have to keep in mind that we have a bearing uh, structure here mm -hmm. that will fail if that integrity is not reestablished. And so there's a lot of different ways to do that. I mean, you can even see over here, um, and I'm not, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not. Yes. Okay, so we, we've got a continual aspect of this whole footing here that, is compromised and I don't know who or done what ever but we've got a dig under here for the water line we've got for the drainway system here but we have to reestablish the integrity of that, those soils in this case this is going to be by uh, gravel or some other compacted material which is tough to now compact it with a footing or foundation above it and this could apply to our interior bearing uh, locations as well on footings that support interior bearing walls stair enclosures, so on and so forth that come on the inside of a building. So it's not just out here on the outside as this one reflects. So here's the sample of uh, section 307 of the IPC that shows us our bearing plane uh, allowances. If we have to dig down in this zone of the 45 degrees off the outer edge of our footing or foundation or whatever our bearing locations are, this is where the code allows us to go in and dig without any compromise of the integrity of the building. However, if we go down in below here, now we have issues because we have a pressure point that's established on here, which then could cause this trench to sag or, or fail. And it not only would it comp compromise the building, but now it starts to push on your drainway systems that are critical of maintaining a slope to maintain functionality. So if we dig down in this area, all's not lost. There are ways for us to take and reestablish that bearing location. So most buildings require a structural fill, especially if you're in the commercial aspect and market of things. And a lot of your jobs in the commercial, you have probably a two foot or up to a four foot, sometimes even an eight foot over dig. And they bring in in lifts a compacted soil. So all we'd have to do in this zone down here is recompact that soil, whatever depth we've gone into that bearing plane. And for most circumstances, you're looking at a 95% or better compaction. That's a, that's a combination of moisture in the type of soil they used, uh, also the, the compaction itself. And that's supposed to be tested at no more than a 12-inch increment. So if you dig in there after it's already been established by the builder and their footing and foundation guys or their soil guys, you go back in and you dig through it, just realize you are probably going to be required to then do some compaction tests through their third-party agency uh, that you'll be responsible for. So any questions on that aspect? I did have a question from Southern Utah about this just two weeks ago, I believe, that they had to dig in on an interior footings to do this. Okay, hearing none, we'll move on. So with also the soils or the excavation aspects of your plumbing systems, the 
this is in the IRC aspect of Chapter 26. Uh, same language is in the IPC. You've got to ensure proper support. So if we over excavate any of our piping, we need to make sure we bed it with appropriate materials to ensure we don't have any sagging and to also hold it in alignment. So oftentimes, uh, myself, as an in, in an enforcement capacity, we show up for an under four plumbing inspection and we'll see piping that's supported about every four or five feet wide with just a little mound of soil. Is that appropriate? Does this satisfy this section of the code? Good question, right? It probably is okay, because what's your support increments on ABS if it weren't in the ground? Okay, the risk involved with this would be that the next guy that shows up after we all do our inspections and you did your test and everything was signed off and, and we all leave, is now you've got somebody coming in and throwing in gravel and everything else that uh, could destroy that alignment or even the, the slope on your piping system. So now we've no longer guaranteed the integrity of your system you've installed. So just be careful with that. And I guess an AHJ would have the ability to say, give us full proper bedding to prevent the sagging based on this code section. So keep that in mind. A couple of concepts with structural integrity and we, we're gonna start talking about walls, uh, studs, uh, beams like headers, beams, uh, floor joists, they all have this common component, which we're going to call compression and tension. And you'll see on this, we've actually got a weight in the blue. We've got a uh, beam that uh, is horizontal in this case. And say we've got a water bed or something nice and heavy in the center of a floor span. And now we've got this reaction of where all these fibers on the top area, usually within the first two inches of any structural beam or wood or even stud or joist, is going to compress together which is usually not where things fail. Usually where uh, our structural elements are gonna fail is on the opposite side of where our loads are, and that's this tension side of this beam. So I joists use this neutral layer or zone to their advantage. That's why they're able to get by with such a small piece of uh, wood, usually a 3 8 or, or so uh, OSB or plywood on the center in this area because they have maintained the critical zones of compression on the top and tension on the bottom of an eye joist. So that's how that load factor works. And obviously we've got the shear plane out here above the green studs in this picture where we have a 45 degree angle coming off of that that is considered our shear. And when we talk about eye joist and the proximity to bearing and what we're allowed to do, that's because they do not have very good compression or resistance from gravitational loads vertically at this location because it is just a small piece of wood and so they tell you get away from the ends to do any of your cutting or notching or holes in an eye joist type material so that concept now if you just rotate this vertically has the same reactions so in the case of a wind load on the outside blowing against a wall, the interior of the stud resisting that wind force is where our tension value is. And unfortunately, that's where we make most of our cuts and notches on the interior of a building. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So here's kind of a more in-depth example of how those reactions are. The wood fibers start to compress and uh, the nice thing is with glue lamb beams, if you all know what a glue lamb is, it's where they take several studs or something of that nature and they glue them all together and they stack them and that's what, why it's called a glue lamb. Laminated wood glued together. They take and put the junk wood in that neutral axis or the center because it's, the, it, it's not needing to be a very strong wood. However, on this tension side, they actually uh, want to protect those. So... Here's an eye joist sample. Basically, we can see where our reinforcement areas are on the top and bottom flanges. Again, we see the OSB, this really cheap wood, not really relevant because it's the neutral zone. So that's why they allow us to cut big holes out here as long as we're getting away from the bearing location on here and it does not affect the integrity of these structural elements. So very nice products great to have now i mean i can't even imagine building homes with normal lumber like they, we did 
20, 30 years ago because of the convenience these are and the consistency and thicknesses from uh, top to bottom where normal lumber can change a quarter inch from one rafter or joist to another. So they had some really consistent framing and, and in buildings being constructed back in the day. So here's a uh, cut uh, clean through a partition wall. We'll talk about partitions and bearing walls. They are different, but they still both have properties we have to honor. And in this case, we have a double top plate that's a partition wall, so it would not have been required to be double top plate. So just because you see a double top plate does not mean it's structural. Sometimes we get on the job, we just look up and, oh, that's doubled, we, it's structural. This one is not. They just A lot of times they do them now double just to stay consistent with the exterior studs so they don't have to change and cut all their interior partitions different or whatever else. So in this case, this is a partition stud, non-bearing. We have requirements for bearing or exterior wall elements, and then we just have interior non-bearing partitions. So when I refer to those two, just make sure you understand the difference between the two phrases. So let's get into the code. In the residential code, we have drilling and notching of studs. So the, the 602 is in our wall section. We'll see similar language when we talk about floor joists and rafters, and they'll be in different sections of the code. But you're not going to see this language uh, like this because all it does is refer you now to the, the IRC or the IBC, the International Building Code, for reference to structural integrity. So in the residential code, we have notching on exterior and bearing studs, we can notch a maximum of 25% of its width. And on interior partition walls, 40% of a notch. And when we get into rafters and joists, you'll see there's actually a middle third restriction for notching where we do not have that on bearing vertical studs. The reactions and forces are still the same, but we don't care about it apparently in the code as much as we do for joists. You'll see what I mean when I show that diagram. So in this case, uh, some of these uh, reference pictures are actually from a, a paper from the Western Woods Production uh, Association. And I'll show you that paper in just a little bit here, but th this is where we get these dimensions. So if I'm talking notching on exterior walls or bearing studs, my notch is 25%. That's maximum 7 eighths of an inch depth. And for non-bearing part in interior partition walls, we have one and seven sixteenths. So think about your plumbing systems and exterior walls. These depths usually are going to be exceeded pretty much for any drainway system we deal with. Hopefully we're using bores instead of notching for our drainway systems and our plumbing, our water, uh, potable water systems, supplying our fixtures because they're just going to be better for the integrity of the building overall anyway. But our heating guys, we do this all the time because our line sets aren't as flexible. And so we end up notching most of the time and we're usually going to have to do something to accommodate or reestablish the integrity of our, our structure because of this. So these pictures are also from the same document, but this gives you an example of bores themselves. It also shows um, a minimum distance here for notching. If, if I do not have 5 eighths of an inch of stud member, remaining on either side of this, that hole would now be considered a notch and would be relevant to this aspect for a two by four stud. So remember we got to maintain five eighths of an inch minimum on the front or back of that. So we get into board holes, we actually are allowed a little more uh, stud to be removed. In this case I've got 60% down here in uh, interior or partition walls and 40% for exterior and bearing studs. Mm -hmm. So in this case, this is a, a two by six. I'm allowed to go up to two and a quarter on a bearing exterior wall for my maximum hole size as long as I have five eighths. And for a notch, I can go two and a quarter versus the seven eighths. And for the notch on a partition wall, oh, excuse me, that's one was the uh, non-bearing up here for the notch, and on the 2 by 6 exterior or bearing walls, 1 and 3 eighths. So 
two by six walls are going to be much more forgiving to us on how much we can take out obviously that's why we like to have a two by six plumbing wall is what you guys refer to them quite often as and a lot of it's because of this reason so now none of this uh, this is mostly to maintain that compression and tension properties of a bearing stud wall so keep that in mind and I again I'll give a, a email Dave those uh, the paperwork that actually shows these on a nice paper uh, that you guys can then print out and give your guys in your trucks to understand and know this so in this case I've got a notch that clearly goes more than 50 percent or uh, this is an exterior wall which looks like it is or a bearing wall I've got trusses coming from above here landing on this wall so this would be a double top plate that is a structural top plate vertical studs those were the numbers that we gave you the 25 and 40 for notch and 40 and 60 for a bore our double top plates have a different number assigned and that's 50 percent so i can take out 50 percent of that two by four double top plate before i have to do anything else to register <coughs> for maintain the integrity so we'll talk about uh, some of these other aspects. Um, let's jump through some of these. Here's our two or five eighths of an inch edge. Otherwise, it's now considered a notch. So in this case here, I've got a drain waste below a kitchen window. And as I go out this wall here, two inch, two by four stud, <coughs> I'm going to have to reinforce this wall. I'm taking too much of it. In most any regard, even if this were a partition, I'm typically going to be over drilling the size of that hole for two inches, or usually what, two and five eighths of an inch or something like that, to allow us to actually run a two inch pipe through those holes. So there's also another code requirement that only allows me to bore or notch two consecutive bearing studs that are nailed together like this. So I've got a three ply member here. I technically cannot notch or bore that at all in any dimension or percentage without doing some reinforcement. We'll skip the visual one because I don't think we'll have enough time to go through all that. Um, some of those people that have been in my class uh, two or three years ago, I actually brought some one by fours and demonstrated the breaks of those. and. Uh, that's what that demonstration would be but anyway here's a code requirement for no more than two successive doubled studs shall be bored and then if we do they've got the provision in here that says we can do stud shoes so here's a sample of an illustration of what a stud shoe looks like and I believe I actually have some pictures of what a stud shoe actually is so in this case where I've got a double top plate and I'm 50 percent more obviously I can't use this little block there to reinforce that even though it's probably a temporary or was meant to be temporary but obviously the HJC contractor has left on this case and wasn't anywhere on site and we're here ready to clear the building for a uh, insulation and drywall so in this state we're gonna have to write this up and say come back and fix it <coughs> now I don't know how well you guys can see this picture but we've got some attempts to fix a partition non-bearing wall this one happens to be in multi-family housing so I've got my fire caulk and stuff around some of these it looks like they've attempted to put in some rock wool to maintain my fire penetrations on this which by the way if you guys are ones installing this is not a code approved installation um, for that but we're not talking about it. we want to talk about these straps right here so I have to reinforce both sides of this double top plate even if it's non-bearing because I've taken out more than 60 percent on a bore or 40 percent on a notch if I did not have OSB on the back side of this like on an exterior wall I would have to do both sides so keep that in mind now this one they put up looks like four nails on each side and the interesting thing about these straps they are provided by your manufacturer specifically with code compliant requirements there's a reason why if you counted these holes there are eight holes on each side of this opening because you're required to put in eight nails you're required to put one strap on each plate so they at least got that part but now we're going to have to add additional nails in here 
So, so on a double top plate, here's the requirement for if we take more than 50%, we're going to have to use this, what we call a structural strap. And that's the terminology used out there, or the jargon, if you want to call it that. It has to be 16 gauge in thickness, an inch and a half in width. And that's why CS16, which is coil strapping, which is commonly used to fix that, this is not coil strapping. Because that is typically only an inch and an eighth or an inch and a quarter, depending on which one and manufacturer you buy. But I haven't seen one out there that's an inch and a half. So technically, you should be not be using that. However, a lot of inspectors have not been requiring that to be replaced if installed. As long as you've got the gauge and the number of nails, it's probably structurally not going to fail. But with CS16 strapping, you'll have hold all along this open face here which then leads the ability of having someone nail or screw through that plate i guess anybody can screw through a metal plate if they have have enough drill bits and try hard enough so you can't protect against that but notice this last one minimum of six inches past the opening so these nails are supposed to be a minimum of six inches past this opening right here so if you're cutting such a big opening like this through these partition or bearing stud areas you're probably going to have a hard time meeting the code based on these that circumstance and that code requirement so any questions on that got a silent crowd out there yep <laughs> <laughs> probably because you guys never install these right you leave it for your superintendents to do it <laughs> here's an old outdated strap because it does not meet the six inch beyond the cuts. And so this has actually been discontinued by, I think this is a Simpson strong tie. This is what they came out with uh, at the very beginning for a, an SS strap. But these are what we commonly see now provided for the ability to do that. So, so would this need a structural strap? <clears throat> Did we lose you? No, I'm still here. Okay. We're saying no then. No. Okay, so this is a two by four wall. What's fifty percent of three and a half? Five One and three quarter. So if this is an inch and a half, my hole's going to be bigger than one and three quarter? It looks like since six inch wall for us. Is it a six inch for you guys? <laughs> well, it looks like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's uh, say it is a, a six inch, two by six wall. What is 50% of five and a half? Two and three quarter. Yeah. So that's, if I'm bigger than a two and three quarter hole, and again, the nice thing about double top plates is I do not have to have the five eighths. It doesn't matter if it's a notch or a, bowl, a bore in this case. So two by six, I'm probably going to be okay. The only thing I would need on this case would be a nail plate or a nail guard to protect it from uh, anybody drilling or, or putting a screw through it. Okay, so nail plates. Nail plate requirements come into play if we are closer than an inch and a quarter to the stud face. Now, that number used to be an inch and a half. In the 2015 editions of the I codes, they actually caught up to what we had in the National Electrical Code for so many years, and it worked for them. So why wouldn't it work for you guys? The only thing with you guys that are HVAC contractors as well, it did not change. So you're still an inch and a half clearance from the hole with any type of mechanical equipment or system, you still need protection. So the only change on that was in the plumbing code, unfortunately. Hopefully we'll catch up with the IMC as well. So we've got all sorts of different strapping out here. We've got the bottom one works as a nail plate or nail guard here in the center of that because this is a 16 gauge, inch and a half wide. This would not work for a structural strap do not have enough nail holes so this would solely be only as a nail plate 
And we've also got these different types up here. Most commonly are these ones that just have the tabs on there. You can nail right into the face of the stud, which work real well. What doesn't work is when you put one of these on plus a structural strap over the top of it, because now you've got a nice half inch bow in the drywall when they come to finish the product on the end. So here's a sample of a stud shoe we talked about earlier. This is for vertical compression against gravitational loads. So this is what we use on vertical studs. If we drill or notch exceeding the capacities identified in the code and or if we noshed or bored more than two studs in a row, like we showed in the kitchen window earlier. So these have compressive strengths, not so much the same as a structural strap as tension. It does have some value for that, but this is again trying to prevent the studs from being crushed from a vertical snow load, for example, on a truss. Okay, so here's the uh, guards against physical protection. Uh, the 16 gauge is the same as our structural straps. We only uh, have this requirement of the inch and a quarter. That was the change in 2015 editions. The difference on here is we have two inches above and below our plates. So this is only required on the plates, not on our studs, vertical. We do not have to have a two inch extension beyond each side on our studs. So not talking about these types of nail plates or guards. If you looked up on the internet, as I found, I found tons of pictures of these wonderful Asians with their nail guards. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, there you go. There we go. Yeah, you <laughs> Protection in studs again here. <clears throat> Sometimes we have to do it on both sides. We've got the two inch above our sole plate here. Again, we don't have to put these on the sides. There is an amendment in the code for commercial to not require this, but in residential, it is still applicable. Okay, so here's where you've got the reference in the mechanical code section where we still have the inch and a half uh, clearance from the stud face. So when we're actually measuring that. This is actually an electrical cable, but they had the best reference for this in another code uh, aspect. But it's from the face of that drilled hole to the stud face, not necessarily where we've got the pipe secured in there. So it's the actual hole we create. So in this case, we have a lot of electricians that'll move it down or you know strap it or whatever else to the back of the stud saying well I've got an inch and a quarter stud clearance on there I shouldn't need an L guards but you've still got to do it because the hole is less than an inch and a quarter so same same language and provision is applicable to plumbing systems so in this case I've got uh, some nice uh, joists that we've gone in and cut all along on the bottom cord or board, bottom section, which is my tension aspect of this. Now, if this is non-bearing and nothing is going to go above here, is this okay? Probably so. But if this is now a mechanical loft where I'm going to have access to personnel walking up there and going back and forth or even putting equipment, then this is going to be a, a big no-no. As you can see, this is just a fur down, so my bearing location is back another two or three feet from where these uh, looks like two by threes or something are along the face here. And so we're going to be dealing with some serious tension loss problems on these uh, joists or rafters. So here's a glue lamb beam. This is a uh, stacked laminated lumber. They've got their good wood on the bottom and good wood on the top. And you're going to see here that this was notched just slightly for a drain waste to go above. And unfortunately, anytime these are touched in any way, shape, or form, we have to send you to a professional engineer to come back with a fix on that, or at least do an analysis on that to clear it. On nominal lumber, there's actually quite a bit we can do in the code that gives us directions prescriptively on how to address notching or boring on that. And we'll have some diagrams that show those later on. But glue lambs, pair lambs, micro lambs, they're all laminated engineered wood products. We cannot touch them in any way unless we have clearance. I joists are an engineered product. <coughs> Same rules apply. So this just happens to be electrical conduit, but I see this quite often for our culinary water lines going up to a tub 
or a sink or something like that, a lav uh, above. And obviously now this joist is going to require repair because I've damaged the top flange of this eye joist. So, all right, now let's get into the floor joist aspects of this. And uh, these are normal wood. So again, we don't see this a lot anymore because we're not using two by tens or two by twelves for our joists anymore. Where we're pretty much the market's taken over with eye joists. But you can see we could actually notch and bore and stuff quite a bit on these, as long as I stayed outside the middle third, and I put my bores in the middle third of the inner dimension of this, and as long as I maintain two inches of clearance from my bottom of my a hole to the bottom of the joist or rafter we are ma basically maintaining the same tension properties that we have on an eye, eye joist but I can notch once I get outside that middle third up to one sixth the depth of whatever my joist depth is and a bore cannot exceed more than one third the depth of my joist or rafter depth so this is that table. We can even notch on the top as long as I'm again outside the middle third and I do not exceed more than one third on the top where below on the bottom I'm only allowed one sixth. So interesting enough, we can also notch on the ends up to a quarter of the depth of a beam. And again, these only apply to normal wood installations, does not apply to engineered products. So. Here's the code references for that. This is in the residential code for floors. That's what uh, chapter five is in regards to. So we're talking specifically joists in this case, but you'll see the same uh, picture and stuff for rafters when we get into roofs and such later on in the code. So, and here's some samples of different holes and stuff that could be bored through. All of these would be something we'd have to kick back to a design professional to do an analysis on and also re recommend a fix. So this is where that requirement comes from in the code. And there are some manufacturer representatives at some of your supply houses that are certified to do that. That may not be an actual uh, registered professional engineer that can and do have permission from uh, like iJoyce or uh, Boise Cascade, uh, any of those manufacturers that they could possibly provide you a fix within, with limitations. So let's talk trusses. Trusses cannot be drilled, notched, or cut or anything. So in this case, someone forgot to put a beam in. We're written up, and then they forgot to call us back for an inspection. So they actually slid a beam in here, and we got up in there to check it at the final. And this is many years ago in another jurisdiction, but they had actually took and cut out all these trusses, about eight of them in a row that they took and cut out, and that was a big, big fix. But I've also seen just a small hole for electrical being drilled through the center of studs on a bonus room above a garage that's actually required quite an extensive fix so trusses they do not like you cutting doing anything whatsoever and again we would have to kick you back to the actual engineer of the truss uh, itself to come up with any fixes for those that equates to a lot of lost time on the job for the superintendent so they do not like it when that happens I always like to throw in some just interesting pictures every now and then. Here's a wonderful S trap that we have in here. Here's some other things. A uh, shower pan is a requirement in the code that you guys usually don't deal with. But because we do install a shower receptor, now it requires some other accommodations such as this threshold, some liner backing around the outer edge. And just to kind of give you guys some ideas of what other people have to do to accommodate because you've used a shower receptor. Um, I don't know how many of you plumbers out there are usually putting these in, but it's usually the tile guy or the superintendent or the framer that comes back and puts it in. However, who's responsible to put nail guards in that piping now? Plumber? Superintendent? Who knows? As far as an enforcement agency, we show up and see this. All we do is we write that up, say it has to be done, and then who installs it? is up to the superintendent to take that charge. So here's our curb height requirements for the integrity of our shower. 
again, our thresholds and our uh, outer curb is to give us enough height to nail our liner onto to give us a good marriage location for any weather paper or other product above to create that shingle effect, actually get the water effectively to your waste receptor that's covered in the IPC. So here's another one for fr uh, frost closure. This is uh, an older installation. This would not be code compliant now in, in protecting the piping in this case. If we have a frost closure, we're trying to protect not only the piping at the top where it could split out and freeze and wherever else, but now we're effectively closing off our vents uh, if that happens. Is this requirement here is now required to be one foot inside my thermal envelope. So this is insulation down here is where my thermal envelope would be. And so I've effectively got to extend that down into my wall. The other option would be is now they create an insulation barrier here that's full insulation value and they would actually have to remove the insulation here for this to now be a semi-conditioned space. So that's really not a, a solution for them that's easy to do. So here's our frost closure or hoar frost as some of you may know it uh, that happens. And this is the requirement out of the IRC for 97.5% values below zero. So we're looking at areas like Park City, Summit, Wasatch Counties, if you work out in Duchesne or even out in Delta, or up in Box Elder County, out in Grouse Creek, those areas would probably all be subject to this requirement. So here's another uh, protection from our vent system here where we've got this vent, got a wonderful S-trap here. This doesn't protect our system at all because now I got this S-trap and those that know about vents and stuff obviously know that's not a, a good way to do it. I also see this on occasion where plumbers didn't come back. Apparently after the uh, cabinetry was all done and or forgot to put on their air maintenance valve. Somebody else was there working, probably smelt the, ga the gases from the sewer system, and their solution was just to stuff it full of rags. This was at a final inspection on a house. They're ready to move in the next day. So, okay, now protection from freezing. We've got uh, some code requirements. I actually had a call on this just a couple of months ago from an individual that was asking about a shower that was in a home. He was just getting ready to, they were actually had, on contract to buy, they went out and looked at it during the, the rough <coughs> and noticed that their shower control valve was on the outside wall. Is that legal or is it not? It's legal as long as it's protected. And this is a pretty ambiguous code requirement because what is protected? To what degree? So this is a discretionary thing that you, you as the plumber and, and the AHJ would have to talk about or come to a compromise on to see if you can actually put it in those walls. One aspect that this is just protecting the piping system from freezing, but you're also creating an inconvenience because now every time they exercise that shower valve, they're going to have a lot of cold water. They're going to have to run through their system uh, before it warms up to where they can actually be comfort and be where it's supposed to be. So there's a lot of wastewater as well. So that's kind of against the whole idea and um, ethics of water conservation because we're installing it out there. But anyway, any questions or feedback? AHJ, you got me. Authority having jurisdictions, so a city, county, or a water purveyor. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 